The Angry Chicken is a production of AMove TV. Bookmark AMove.tv for more gaming and esports shows. The Angry Chicken is directly supported by listeners like you via patreon.com slash TAC. podcast about Hearthstone, Heroes of Warcraft. This is the Angry Chicken. Happy Tuesday, everyone. This is indeed the Angry Chicken. I'm Garrett Weinzerl. He's Willie Dills Gregory. She's Jocelyn Moffat. And we have a special guest today, a fourth chair. He's Peter Whalen, a game designer from a little indie game called Hearthstone, made by an even more indie company, Blizzard. Oh, the joke's dead already. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show, Peter. Thanks, Garrett. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you. We, uh, we, and by the way, to our listeners out there who are like, wait, what? Why didn't you announce this on last episode? Uh, we, we, did, we weren't sure. Uh, we weren't sure who was coming on yet until after the episode aired. So, uh, surprise! Developer interview, everybody. But we're excited. To, uh, we're excited to have you here. Some, some stuff has has happened. Uh, like in you know certain developers or maybe balanced designers on the team speaking publicly uh less than 24 hours ago that may have uh that could have affected this conversation um we had approved questions ahead of time we're gonna mostly stick to those but the conversation <laughs> may meander we promise peter's Most. like woo. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I guess uh, first things first is a uh, uh, belated congratulations on the release of Witchwood. Thank you. It's it's been a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun playing it. The Monster Hunt the last couple of weeks has been pretty awesome. I have found myself playing it more than more than I thought I would. I'm not usually a single player guy, and uh, I have actually found myself plinking away at it uh, a little more <laughs> than expected. Plinking away. Yes, <laughs> yes, Jocelyn, plinking away. Don't ask me to define the word. <laughs> the official term. Yes, yes, we get very technical here. Uh, but yeah, since you're here, I mean, let's 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 talk Witchwood. Uh, we promise we're gonna mention balance a little bit later on. But but first, I just wanted to talk about the expansion. Uh, I mean, there were, there's so many different avenues. Uh, but I'm gonna go to just a personal one. I, I want to know about Rush. I want to know how Rush came to be. Uh, like, was there a meeting where someone just threw it out? Did one designer just come barging in the door being like, guys, I solved charge. I did it. So, I mean, it's been around for a long time. We've known that charge is one of those mechanics that feels really, really good. It's amazing when you get to attack with your guy the turn you play it, but it's less amazing when you have 30 health and then you're dead because you're going to play a bunch of charge guys and faceless them or power overwhelming, whatever. However they killed you, you're pretty sad. So... We wanted something that fixes that, and we tried a bunch of different variations on Rush in the past. There's Ice Howl, who has charge but can't attack players. There's Charge Devil Sore, who sort of can't attack players unless you recruit it out and then faceless it a bunch of times or cube it and then kill the other guy. <laughs> but uh, uh, so Rush is is kind of the the nice version of those mechanics. So you get to attack the turn you played it, but you can't kill the other guy unless you do some some very serious shenanigans. I don't know. Maybe there's some way to give it charge. I, I'm not even sure you can kill somebody with a rush mini in the turn you play it. Yeah, I think I think rush actually overwrites charge. Even if you were to give it charge, if it has rush, I I think there's actually testing done on this that you still can't actually t attack. There's like I, weird I, things quick, with it. I, I think it's the other way, but there's there's probably something that somebody clever can do where you can kill. Somebody. I would love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that. Um. So yeah. It's it's a great mechanic. It's it's really fun to actually get to attack with it and to play with your minions, but it's healthy in the sense that it, we can actually make cards that are powerful that have it without games degenerating into OTKs all the time. Gotcha. Was it like so when it first got announced in my brain? I'm just, I I just assumed that it was very relieving from a design standpoint. If you're if you're working on designing cards and then Rush kind of gets set in stone. Uh, you know, beyond the the kind of uh, playing around with it that you did in the past with things like Ice Howl, like you mentioned, like was that was that true? Did, did everyone in the office were just like, oh, finally, I can make minions that can attack in the same turn? 
Yeah, char- yeah, Rush is awesome. I mean, Charge is awesome too. It just has some design problems. So being able to have combat keywords, things like Divine Shield or Life Steal or Rush, Taunt, they make minions more interesting. They don't take up a lot of tech space and players learn them so they don't take up a lot of mental complexity space either. And so they're they're great. And Rush in particular, it's just it's very, very satisfying. Nice to be able to do things with it that the turn it comes out. So we talked a little bit just about design here, but then you guys also put something in without actually putting a new keyword into the game. And I'm talking specifically about all of the odd and even deck designs. So when you guys first came up with Baku and Greymane, is this something that you thought was just going to like click with players? Did you think it was going to be super powerful? And are you kind of worried about potential like mana cost of cards and design space kind of going forward? So I think this is one of those where you throw it out there and everybody's like, huh. <laughs> that was definitely us. We were like, hmm. Huh. Are they going to do like square roots and factorials <laughs> or prime numbers next? What, what's going on here? And so we had that reaction on the design team as well. But the more we played with it, it's pretty cool. Odd and even is a pretty interesting distinction and it's different in some classes than others. Originally, we had the odd and even thing playing into, uh, there was a monster vibe very early on where every class had one of their legendary minions was a monster and all the monsters upgraded your deck in some way. Maybe they shuffled something cool in. Uh, Lady in White uh, and Prince Liam are examples of designs that survived from that. They transform the cards in your deck either into legendaries or setting their tactical or health. So we had those designs and we were using that for the odd and even space as well, but it just wasn't that cool. Uh, We tried out (laughs) hero cards with it as well. And it ran into the Reno Jackson issue where Mm. you're paying this enormous deck building cost, but you only sometimes get the payout. And so we wanted something that was a little bit smoother, that didn't have these hugely spiky moments where either you drew your Gen or your Baku or you didn't. And so we went with the start of game stuff. And the thing that makes the most sense at the start of the game is changing your hero power. And so uh, one of our designers had the awesome idea of let's use that to smooth out your curve. You can't play even cards, so let's give you something to do on odd turns. You can't play odd things, so let's make your hero power better so you're happy to do it on even turns. I think it actually ended up working out really well, and they're really fun to play. It, I'm surprised how, how smooth it's gone. You know, whether, you know, like your everyone's personal opinions about odd and even paladin and whether they're happy to see it in a matchup <laughs> aside, like, I'm, I'm very impressed because I was, I mean, I think all three of us have, have gone, went through different stages of, I don't know about this. I don't know if this is going to work. Like, I, I definitely enjoy it more than, say, Kaliseth type things mm. and like the deck mm-hmm. challenge the deck building challenge just you you have the challenge and then you don't have to draw the said card like that is making the challenge online and it just means like you get the immediate reward for doing the deck challenge and you can balance accordingly right like balancing around drawing a card can be really tough so i think this is a much better way to handle it i really enjoy it yeah i like it a lot better uh i want to talk about uh cards that maybe don't seem to have a place yet but sometimes cards take a few expansions to really start to shine uh, without giving us like too much information about future <laughs> sets. Do you think there are any Witchwood cards that haven't seen play yet that maybe we should uh, keep an eye on? So I don't want to spoil anything that's upcoming, but uh, there's a couple of cards. Like, let's just look at some of the neutral, simple cards, like common type stuff that we did put in because, you know, initial design was experimenting with sets in the future and they said, you know, it would be really cool if we had a taunt lifesteal demon. Having a taunt lifesteal demon somewhere in the medium size, that would be really useful for this thing that we're trying out. We're not sure it's very powerful, but could could we make sure that that happens? And Final Design was awesome, and they accommodated us, and there's Fel Soul Inquisitor. It's not a super powerful card. I don't want to... Please don't take me the <laughs> wrong way. It's going to be a super powerful card in the future. I, I don't believe that. But it was playing into something that we were doing, and so it, it seeds a little bit. Um... Unpowered Steambot, the 09 Taunt, that's another example of here's this card that will play into some stuff that we were trying out in the future. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, but it was kind of a seed card in that space. I think there's some other cards that are not explicitly for archetypes in the future, but they're more um, interesting cards that might do something cool. So like Witchwood Piper is one of those cards that's right on the edge. If there's some reason that you want to draw low-cost cards from your deck, because whatever it is, uh, maybe maybe Kelisette's the cheapest thing in your deck, and it's really important that you get your Kelisette equivalent on turn four or turn five. You might try Witchwood Piper. Um, 
deranged doctor, the eight mana, eight, eight death rattle. Restore oh, health. yeah. Heal your guy. Sure. <laughs> if you're ever in the market for expensive, large death rattle minion, that's that's kind of a card you might be might be in the space for if you're playing a more defensive deck. So I think I don't have like a deck that he's going to be amazing in nine months from now, but it's more he's the kind of card that's interesting that we think about sometimes when we're designing. Or something like Witchwood Actually, Piper. The, uh, is... Witchwood Piper, I tried to make work with. A Malagos OTK Wild Shaman for a while, and it was pretty fun. Cool. It was basically just like I put three ways to get to my Malagos in the deck, which is like you just need the Malagos, right? So sure. I was Ancestor's Call once you finally get him, and three and two Witchwood Pipers to try to get there. It was it was pretty. It actually worked a few times. That's, awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I was playing it in a Shutterwalk Control type deck. That was was pretty fun. Is is a card like Witchwood Piper? Is that tempting for future cards? You're just like, oh, I'm working on this low cost card, and can can we maybe just push it over the edge just a little bit? Because I want Witchwood Piper to be gnarly. I think Witchwood Piper is the kind of card that you'll certainly try out again, even if it didn't find a home in this particular meta game. Someday people are going to try it out and say, oh, there's this really cool card we want to grab with it. Let's see what we can do. Well, yeah, because pulling specific cards from your deck has been so powerful. So, I mean, anything that ha has that effect has got to be difficult to design around and then also kind of, like, cool and powerful to play with. Difficult to design around is one of those code <laughs> phrases that also means there's something really cool here. Like, <laughs> I know design has to be really worried about it. We have to make sure that the balance is okay. But there's something awesome. It's good that you don't necessarily just discount it just because you're not quite sure how it's even going to work. So let's let's move in and talk about balance a little bit. Um, there was quite a bit of balance talk happening yesterday. Um, I'm I'm just curious, like how how happy is the team with class diversity in standard after which was launch, like overall? So we just had the EU uh, HCT playoffs last weekend, and all of the classes were represented, though some were more represented <laughs> than others. Uh, so I think there's a lot of great class diversity. A lot of the classes are seeing play. You're seeing a lot of interesting decks. Several of the classes are supporting multiple decks. You mentioned Paladin has at least three very high-tier decks. Uh, there's a couple of different Warlock builds that are interesting. There's a bunch of classes that are trying out a lot of stuff. So I think that's awesome. I think there's a bunch of great Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 decks that people can try out and experiment with and really just play different things if you want to. So I think that's, that's really great. Uh, Dean talked a bit about what some of our future plans are, but we're planning on doing... Uh, some adjustments towards this, the end of this month, and we're looking at a bunch of cards to see what what that's going to look like. Okay. Do we just want to jump to to the card to the cards question now? Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, so I mean, we've talked so much on the show about different cards that are we kind of see as problematic, and I know Dean actually gave us a specific like list of cards that you guys are looking at. And one of those was on our list as well, Call to Arms, obviously. <laughs> uh, but we had a couple of other ones, too. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Call to Arms is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, pretty good, I think, is an understatement. But <laughs> we were also looking at things like Cube and then uh, Hadronox being able to, to bring back all of those taunts and Druid. So can you just talk a little bit about like how you go about identifying like problematic cards? and why the, the ones that Ixar identified maybe kind of made it onto that watch list? So there's a couple ways that we look at it. One is we just play a lot of games. I think most of the design team, maybe everybody on the design team, plays a lot of Hearthstone. A lot of us hit Legend last month, hit Legend regularly, and so that, that takes some number of games and some experience with the metagame. So that's a lot of our experience is what we personally are encountering. We read a ton of feedback from... Reddit, from our forums, from Twitter, from a bunch of different sources of people getting in touch with us to say, these cards are bothering me. This is creating a play experience that I'm not enjoying. These things are overpowered. Uh, we also get a ton of data. We have data for what are the best decks, what are the most played decks, what are the best cards in those decks, what are the best players playing, and what are players playing at the highest levels, which aren't necessarily the same thing as these are the best decks overall. And we'll also break it up by... You know, these are the things being played at Legend. These are the things being played at Legend or Rank 5. These are the things that we're looking at at other, other play brackets as well. So we juggle all of these things together and we say, what are the things that we can do that will create a fresh, open metagame in a way that's fun and fair and shakes things up, but 
but also respects the fact that people love the decks that they're playing. We don't want to just change things for the sake of changing things because it feels bad if we if you love Q-Block and we change Q-Block, you feel pretty sad. You you love that deck. So we try to take that into account and make sure that we respect that, but also respect the guys who are really really tired of playing as Q-Block. So, I was say, I think there's a lot more people tired of playing against Q-Block than there are people who are just like, yeah, Q-Block's my jam. I don't know. Well, we... I think there's a, a lot more people that say Q-Block's my jam that would not post that on Reddit. <laughs> well, that's also that's true. They're hiding. <laughs> yeah, the silent, the silent majority of Q-Block players. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people for each of the decks that, that really are passionate about it and really do love it. So we just we have to take that into account and be careful and considerate of those people as well. I, I will say that I find Q-Block to be a really interesting deck to play, an interesting deck to play against. I think one of the issues is that it seems like they can do so many things so well, right? Like, I played against the Q-Block, and I posted this on Twitter where I was like, he healed for, like, 48 and cleared, like, seven boards that I that I built <laughs> and also played Giants and also did that. And I was just like, and also it dealt seems like a lot of things he was turn. able to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah, that's probably one of the issues is, like, like, cause yeah, I think statistically I play it, and I don't think it's actually OP at all. Like, I get I get beat all the time when I play it. But yeah, it's one of those things where it's just playing against it. You're like, how could he do all of this? <laughs> uh, and yeah, that might be the issue there. But uh, what about uh, what about any other cards like that you guys didn't mention that are maybe like I Void Lord didn't seem to come <laughs> up. Speaking of uh, these things, are there, are there like I mean I don't I know you know you don't want to give away too much, but is is there anything else that's like on the radar? Uh, so Dean mentioned a bunch of cards. I don't have his his exact list in front of me right now. Oh, but... I do. <laughs> <laughs> you read off Dean's list. That's exactly what I'm supposed to say, and it's perfect. All right. So, um, but in general, what we're looking at is we think that there's crazy things happening a little bit too early. You're generating very high mana turns a little bit before it's healthy, and there's sort sure. of answers in place to to take care of them. So you know, possessed lackey is a good example of that. It comes out on turn five. You can turn it into a Void Lord pretty quickly. That's that's pretty big. Spiteful Summoner, a uh, Quest Rogue, so the, the Rogue Quest. There's a bunch of things that are kind of in that space. Call to Arms is another example that are just, these are creating moments where crazy things are happening a bit too early. Uh, Naga Sea Witch in Wild, that, mm -hmm. you know, turn five, there's a whole bunch of giants. It's a little bit too early for all of this craziness that's happening. And so we're generally looking at how can we push that a little bit farther back? How can we uh, just give you a little bit more opportunity to either develop your game plan before crazy stuff starts happening or have answers ready so that you can deal with it when crazy stuff does start happening? Yeah, I think that's the key, right? Because the, the reason like Undertaker was such a problem when it happened is like it just comes out on turn one and the other guy's just going, OK, I only have three cards right now. I don't know what I'm supposed to do about this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's just, it seems like because power spikes are fun. I really do feel like power spikes are super fun. If you, but I, I think they're more fun when you kind of have to get there in a certain way. You got to set it up, right? Not just, oh, cool, I drew into the thing I needed, right? Like, like yeah. the barns on turn four stuff. This off is a great out. example, right? On turn ten, you generate a whole bunch of value death rattle minions. Yeah, pretty good. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's that's why I like. I'm, I'm, I wasn't necessarily surprised to see XR not mention Void Lord because I don't think Void Lord's necessarily the issue. I think it's the, the ways to get Void Lord out earlier. If I if, some, yeah. if my opponent's paying nine mana for his Void Lord, I'm fine. I'm just like, yep, that's fair. I, I'm okay with this transaction. <laughs> yeah, I think Void Lord's definitely a card to keep an eye on, but I think it's definitely getting it out a little bit too early that's really the feel-bad part yeah. of it. It's the getting it out early and then playing it again and again and again. Yeah, the getting it back a hundred times. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's why I I brought up like that the Hadronox uh, and and Taunt Druid. It it has a very similar feeling, um, but the only the only card Dean mentioned was Spiteful Summoner that I think directly impacts Druid. Yeah, I think Hadronox is an example of one of those things that's happening much later in the game. You have a sure. lot of opportunities to interact with the Druid before you know they they start resummoning Hadronaxes. Hmm. I actually was playing a bunch of Dead Man's Hand Warrior last night, and as soon as I identified that it was a Hadronox Taunt Druid, I was like, okay, we just got a Dead Man's a bunch of brawls. This is fine. <laughs> and then I just, I brawled them like five times and totally won the game, crushed them. That's it was awesome. great. Like, I had to build a strategy against it, which is fine. Yeah, I think if you're playing Dead Man's Hand Warrior, you're kind of signing up for that type of game, where you're going to go <laughs> very long attrition-y games. So I, th I think that's awesome. I love that that's just possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's the cool thing about that deck is you could take 
you can pick which cards are the most important and then just make sure you have lots of those. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I, mean, I think just, that's part of why that deck's so hard to play, too, is you have to pick, you have to know which cards are important, identify them, and then maneuver yourself into a position where that's what you've got left. Yeah, like I was like throwing war cries out, like I was on empty boards. I was like, I just don't want these. Get these out of here. I need the rolls. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, so moving maybe uh, far further away from the obvious cards being discussed, which are now even more obvious because Dean was so kind to, to, to start talking yesterday, but. Um, I'm curious, like, are there any cards raising eyebrows that the community maybe isn't talking about? Are there any surprise, like, overperformers from Witchwood? Like, it seems like there's not a Corridor Creeper in Witchwood. Like, one where we're all like, yeah, that snuck through. I don't think there's anything that the community is not aware of. Our community is very, very good at identifying these are powerful cards, these are powerful archetypes. Uh, let's, let's play lots and lots of them because... People play so many games of Hearthstone and the communication so good right now that, you know, powerful stuff, it propagates. And if there was something that someone was holding back as secret tech, I think we would have started seeing it in the in the playoffs. And, you know, we just saw the, the EU playoffs last weekend and there was nothing wildly off the radar, I think. Cool. OK, so we're, we're having the correct conversation, at least <laughs> or at least with the right the right cards. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, while talking, uh, this is less about specific card balance, but maybe about the game's balance overall. Like uh, for whatever reason, lately we've been getting a lot of emails and 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 tweets asking, like, shouldn't the goal for ladder be a fifty percent win rate for all classes? Like, and I, like that, that always struck me as like that can't be the case, or at least not with the. If that was the case, ladder would have to be swapped up a lot because you wouldn't move anywhere. Well, I think even if a class had a 50% win rate, then individual players might do better than that, presumably, because you know some people are probably better than the average. But the, that notwithstanding, I, I don't think our goal is 50% win rate for all the classes. I think our goal is let every class have fun, exciting archetypes that they can try out. And if you're a person who's super passionate about just playing Shaman, you've got stuff that you're excited about and that you feel good about playing. And so I think we often have archetypes that are low power level and incredibly fun. Historically, Milrogue is an example of people will play Milrogue or Quest Mage even if they're, you know, 40% win rate or 25% win rate or wherever <laughs> Milrogue got down to at some of its lowest points. And it's still a 3% play rate deck. People are still playing it and it's single handedly dragging the win rate of Rogue down. So I don't think that means that Rogue should have a 60% archetype just because it has a super fun low win rate archetype to balance it out. I, I think. The key is just having a healthy metagame with a bunch of different decks, a good variety towards, you know, around that 50% level where there's no decks that are, you know, this is the single deck everyone needs to be playing it. But at the same time, I don't think it's critical that every class is at 50%. Makes yeah, sense. I agree with that. I, I think like one of the most important things for me would just be that there's enough decks that are good that you don't feel like you're ever playing the same thing over and over again, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, as long as that's not happening, I'm good. <laughs> and also that the decks that are good are fun. I think sure. it's really important that you enjoy yeah. playing the decks that are good. I do, uh, so for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> you like playing all the good decks? <laughs> for, the, for the most part, for the most part. I, I've sworn off Paladin even though it's like my one trick class just because I want to I wanna try some other stuff at the beginning of this expansion. I got my golden dudes and then I was like, Oh, I should work on getting golden other stuff, but golden dudes. <laughs> and now Paladin's you, so good right now. <laughs> and now you can make two golden dudes at once. I know. Oh, that's all I've been playing because then, yeah, double the golden dudes. Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> hey, awesome. So we do have a couple questions here about kind of like the future of Hearthstone and uh, where things are going in the game. And very specifically, something that is very close to, I think, all three of our hearts that we've been talking about basically since we started doing the podcast. Tournament mode beta. Can you give us a hint at how that's coming along? It's pretty cool. We actually did a design play test this morning with uh, with our the in-game tournament system, and we played a bunch of games. It was it was really fun. It's it's cool to be able to interact with it and to you know, see your opponent's win loss record and feel like you're you're part of this competition. Sweet. Ed, can you? I mean, I'm not expecting you to be like July 25th, but like any <laughs> hints at uh, are we oh, moving close? Perfect guess there. 
No, I, I the we've announced that it's coming later this year, so that's that's still our target. We're looking for the in-game tournament system to come out in the sort of beta version where we're trying out this is this version of the the in-game tournament system. We'll look for community feedback to see what the next steps are for it. And we're still targeting that coming out towards the end of the year, or later this year. And uh, still planning to launch without bans? Or is that has that been altered at all? For the, for the first version of the, of the beta, we're going to launch without bans, or at least that's the plan, and then see what the uses are that the community has for the system and see what the features are that we most need to implement. And then take a look at that and see where we go from there. Gotcha. What's are you- the best way for us to be like, please give us bans? <laughs> well, play games with the tournament system and then, you know, send us feedback. Cool. I was I was about to ask, like, are you already taking feedback for it? So, like, yeah. when, it, when it was announced and... and it, I think it's probably going to be best for people to actually play with what we've got and then <laughs> give feedback based on that and see how they're actually using it. Are you using it in fireside gatherings? Are you using it with, you know, online friends? Are you using it, you know, at just your house with your family? So depending on what setting you're using it in, you might have other features that you're requesting. Makes sense. Okay. That's, I hadn't really thought about that. I've, I've, I've been talking to our, our fireside group and I like we in our head are just like, it's probably just be for pickup tournaments because we run tournaments and they have bands. So we're all just like, well, I guess th- this will be for the folks that, that, you know, maybe got locked out of the bracket. They can now do a pickup tournament on the go. But yeah, I think that's, I think that's a totally viable use for it. I think we'll see what people experiment with and then, what the best features are to take it going forward. Okay. Can we dip our, uh, Dale, do you want to, want to, uh, like, can we dip our toes in arena a little bit? Yeah. Uh, okay. So one of the biggest, I think, or one, yeah, you know, one of the most common bits of feedback I hear when I, I, I talk to a lot of arena players who are arena exclusive players too, by the way. Uh, and one of their biggest concerns is just that we don't know all of the details about, the, the selection process, right? And there's a lot of people uh, you know, doing very detailed research on HS Replay and their own spreadsheets and things, trying to figure out exactly how things work. Uh, is, is there like a reason why we're not told a lot of specifics? Is it, is it more of like a, you know, things change a little bit more often than we have the ability to kind of like give that feedback? Or is there just something that you guys just feel like, no, we're giving the amount of information we want? Is there a reason why we don't know exact like, you know, proportions of what cards come and which buckets and all that kind of stuff? It's a combination of a couple of different things. So in the past, the arena system was very simple. There were particular adjustments to some of the buckets. You know, the most recent set would happen more frequently than other sets. Spells would happen more frequently than other cards. Some, there were particular adjustments that we could say like that. Uh, in the last year or so, maybe more recent, I'm not exactly sure on the time frame, uh, we started doing what we call internally micro-adjustments, which are very small adjustments to individual cards to try and make the classes more evenly balanced. In the past, we would have cases where warrior win rates were sub 40%, and we'd have some of the best class win rates north of 55%. And it made it so that when you were being offered classes at the start of Arena, it was a false choice. You were supposed to pick Paladin, or you're supposed to pick Mage, or you're supposed to pick Rogue, and you weren't supposed to pick some of the other ones. And that, that feels pretty bad. False choices where... You know, you're doing the wrong thing because you're playing the class that you really want to play. Feel pretty bad. And so we talked a lot about what the best things were to do for that. And using a bunch of data analytics, we have a very, very smart guy uh, who works with data analytics that works on Arena now in part. And he's doing these micro adjustments where he looks at which cards he can tweak to adjust the win rates of various classes in various directions. So that at the start of Arena, when you pick, you know, Druid or you pick Hunter, or you pick Paladin, you feel pretty good about it. And so, as a result of that, we're making these changes much more frequently than we used to. We're doing it basically with each of these small patches. We just released uh, 11.1 this morning, I think. Or, yeah, I yeah. saw Paladin got, I think, changed quite a bit to yeah, bring it there, back so in line. Yeah, and a bunch of small adjustments to Arena that happened in that patch. And so, one of the things we've been talking about is how can we message that best to our players? We're talking about possibly thousands of adjustments that are, this card is offered 1% less, or this card is offered 2% more. What is a way that we can message that that's helpful? Is it, should we just give you guys a spreadsheet that is, you know, this card is offered, you know, 1% more than, than normal. 
is that is that useful? Is that just confusing? How do we maintain that in a way that's healthy that we're not costing a bunch of development resources as we make these small changes? We don't want to create additional burden so that it's harder to keep Arena fun and exciting. All right. At the core, the most important thing to us is that Arena is fun, Arena is fair, and that you feel good playing it. And so how do we do that and also communicate the right way to the community? And so I, I'm open to feedback. I think as a team, we're open to feedback on this. What's the best way to do that, especially for these, these micro type adjustments that would be helpful both to the super, super invested guys, the guys building tools and things, but also if you're just an arena player and you're invested and you're on Reddit and you're looking at our blog posts and you read this thing, I don't really want to give you a thousand card spreadsheet. That's not going to be that meaningful. What's the most helpful way that we can communicate to you? So it's something that we're thinking about. I don't think philosophically our goal is obfuscation. It's more we want to communicate in a way that's clear and satisfying while still being able to make arena fun and fair. I'm pretty sure the super invested yeah. guys are like, give us the spreadsheet. Yeah, they want all of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. so, It'll be balanced their needs against. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly less. I, I think though, uh, you know, there there is there's definitely like a way because you know I used to play a lot of World of Warcraft and there was got you know I'd, I'd go on uh, I'd go on elitist jerks right and all these guys are like pouring over the data and then I would go on there and just be like, okay, what's the best build? You guys <laughs> figured all the smart guys figured it out for me. Now just parse it out. And just show me like which talents to pick, right? And or I would like plug in my gear into the the whatever the dwarf cool. thing <laughs> DPS measure thing was. Yeah, I just plug it in. I'd be like, hey, I'm supposed to be doing this much DPS. I'm not. Okay, I guess I'm doing something wrong. Like I, I do think, yeah, if you can f at least find that data, that would be helpful. But I I do agree. Like you probably don't want to shove it into everyone's face where it's like yeah, people open up something and go like what is all this yeah <laughs> yeah right yeah, it's, it is tricky thousand cards and patch notes and just drown out everything else <laughs> yeah yeah the first the first place my my brain goes is getting getting that extremely granular information to the parties that want it and already provide some type of service whether it is an arena tier list or any type of arena tools um like they they not only probably want this information more than any of us, uh, but could digest it into something usable for the community. Whereas, yeah, I don't I don't think I want to hit the arena button and be like and, and a pop up in the innkeeper to be like there are some changes and just be <laughs> scrolling for a year. I like I don't I don't think that's the answer. Oh, man. I can just imagine th that recording session with the innkeeper where he's just gonna read all those things out <laughs> <laughs> by the end of it. <laughs> yeah, oh, just passing out, passing out. That'd be terrible, but. <laughs> Um, while we're still on, while we're still on Arena, and this this is just here for my own amusement, but are there are there any plans or any talks for competitive Arena? Like, for example, like I think you can probably go back to very early episodes of this show and us talking about like just challenging a friend with an Arena deck, something as seemingly simple as that. Don't know how I'm sure it's a lot harder to actually pull <laughs> off on the coding end than I, it sounds. I don't want to speak to how technically easy that is. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's not really my position. Um, <laughs> but we don't have any plans to do competitive arena in the clients or as things that we're running. I think the community's done some fantastic events that are competitive arena type things in the past. I think that's awesome. I, I'm excited whenever there's a new type of tournament that, that the community is putting on. I think that's awesome. Okay. I'll give you one, one suggestion. Let me uh, spectate drafting. Mm. Oh, that'd be sweet. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Because co-op co arena has definitely become one of my favorite ways to play, uh, like where you get to discuss each pick. Like we've done it on this show. We've a few done times. it, yeah, multiple times, yeah. yeah. And it is super fun. That, that's one of the coolest things about arena is just like it opens up discussions about cards where, in constructed, you're like, yeah, this card's terrible. It's not going in any deck. And in arena, you're like, we got to put one of these terrible cards in. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> sure. Yeah, playing arena with your friends is awesome. Like we've had that happen in the office. We're just. You know, somebody's decided, oh, I'm going to play an arena. And then there's four people crowding around his desk yeah, saying, crowds around the yeah, desk. Do this, this one. pick this one. <laughs> <laughs> Backseat arena <-ing. laughs> oh, It's for the memes, guys. you got to pick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you should run a stream. That's how that's how you, you have the, the heart uh -huh. of a streamer. If you're oh, if you're picking the. That's awesome. The... you got to pick Feral Dribber every time. It's the rule. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a good arena card. <laughs> yeah, every time. Especially in a, in a world where there's tons of Paladin, 
Because it's not getting pinged off all the time. You play it on turn one, and Paladin can't deal with it. And it's only you got like five feral gibbers in your face. <laughs> your hands full of feral gibbers. Your board is full of feral gibbers. It's just, it's the best. <laughs> I love that card. I wish it got offered to me in Arena more. <laughs> well, Peter, I mean, we we appreciate your time. We're 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 basically we're out of questions. Unless we want to just start bombarding you with things that we probably shouldn't ask and we don't expect questions or answers to. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say Peter's screen is no just gonna go black. <laughs> <laughs> we just see a hook come from off screen. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but thank you so much. I mean, you're, I know you're on I know you're on Twitter. Uh, but when, before you go, if anyone wants to to keep up with you specifically, uh, where can they where can they find you? Yeah, Twitter is the best place. Uh, yeah, at at Legendary Ferret. That's the place I'm most likely to respond to things. And I see things the easiest. I I'm also watch Reddit and our forums and some of those channels as well. So, uh, yeah, but Twitter is the easiest way if, uh, to get a response from me at least. So uh, quickly, what deck are you playing? Ferret. <laughs> oh man, that's been. I've had that name since high school, probably. Yeah, very... <laughs> it seems Sweet. like one of those things you do when you're really young and you think no one's ever going to pay attention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It seems pretty safe, but I'm yeah. like, it's a little bit. Uh, it's not very serious. There's some ones that are like, oh, this is a really serious name. This one's just, I don't know. It's a little silly. Did you have a ferret uh, in high school? I did not. I have never had a ferret. <laughs> That makes the name so much better. <laughs> I I do, and that's why I asked. Uh, oh, I will, that's awesome. I will start calling him uh, Waylon, I guess. Oh. <laughs> he probably had a name already. He might prefer that one. <laughs> he probably does. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Dills, you had, a, you had a, a parting question. I was just going to ask Peter what, what deck he's playing. Oh, and also, what deck is Mike Denae playing? Because I want to know how to win. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Mike's probably playing some like really slow control mage that has infinite random card generation sure like, he Perfect. absolutely loves decks like that so that's that's my guess uh, all right Mike, like all of us plays a whole bunch of different decks uh what have i been playing lately i played a bunch of even shaman for a quest last night well, it was pretty fun it was interesting uh i've played a bunch of uh burgle rogue the, Ooh, uh, yeah i like that deck um, some meme Shutterwalk Shaman stuff. The more the controlling one than the OTK one. Uh, I'm still working on Golden Rogue and Golden Shaman, so I've been playing a lot with both those classes. You should definitely go into Wild and play Shutterwalk with Yogg. Oh my god. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds pretty cool. Shutter Yogg is... Uh... It does not win, but it is super fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's that. awesome. Yeah, I've actually been playing some, some Wild lately. Uh, my dad plays a bunch of Hearthstone, and he got super into wild he actually hit legend and wild last month and he was super excited about it so i've been playing some some wild with him that is the coolest thing i've ever heard <laughs> I, I think it's awesome so i'm giving him a plug on the show I think that's <laughs> i'm going to send this clip to my dad be like dad see we can bond here's another yeah, way we can bond up, dad <laughs> it's really cool being able to play hearthstone with your family it's been awesome for me i think it's really it's really a great experience probably make it probably has potential to create different arguments at thanksgiving though <laughs> uh, yes yes <laughs> why haven't you nerfed this card <laughs> i hadn't even considered that i was thinking just of bad beats and being angry that someone top decked the card that they needed but <laughs> well peter... it's really it's really pretty awesome <laughs> well peter thank you again we really appreciate your time so any any time you know if you just get the uh get the itch to start uh talking on a podcast let us know you you always have a seat well, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Have a great one, Peter, and congratulations Thanks. again on Witchwood. You too. Thank you very much. And this will cause the uh, this will cause the overlay to explode. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna just take a minute, and y'all can watch me uh, readjusting lay things out. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be great. We're gonna <laughs> get a Dills here. We're gonna get a Jocelyn here. Bam. And we're gonna move him around. That was fun. Yeah, I like Peter. He's always such a happy guy. So smiley. <laughs> I love that he didn't have a ferret. That's I was yeah. so expecting. <laughs> I was so expecting. Oh yeah, we had like a five store, a five tier cage. We had tubes running around the house. Like I was, ex I was expecting some, like big investment in ferret keeping to be uh, yeah. behind his Twitter handle. But so that was, I mean, uh, does that mean that like he just sees himself as very ferret-like. <laughs> he is the most legendary of all the ferrets. Well, here's the thing about high school nicknames. You don't get to give them to yourself. 
That's so, true. That's true. So I don't know. Dills, did you give yourself the name Dills or was that someone? That was someone else, right? Somebody yeah, that was, a, that was a guy I went to high school with. Mm, mm. It just kind of stuck. Kind of stuck. Still sounds dirty to me. <laughs> well, awesome. All right, so we can move. Uh, we can move into news. But before we do, we actually we should we should probably you know thank like a sponsor because we have one for the show, and I'm sure they would very much appreciate it if we let our listeners know uh, that this episode is sponsored by Harrys.com/tac. If you somehow have not heard a Harry's sponsor message on this show because they have been the longest running sponsor of the Angry Chicken, uh, they make awesome razors to shave your face and et cetera and other with. Parts. Exactly. And <laughs> other parts. We <laughs> typically make jokes about shoulders. They're not jokes. It's actually very serious. Shoulder hair. Not everyone's into it. I might be. Dills might not be. You can take care of it with <laughs> Harry's razors. Whatever the case is, <laughs> they make great razors. You should check them out over at harrys.com slash TAC. And they still have a special offer for TAC listeners. You can get their trial set valued at $13 when you sign up over at harrys.com slash TAC. That gets you a weighted ergonomic handle, uh, their cartridge with five precision engineered blades, complete with lubricating strip, and a trimmer blade. So yeah, this neck beard, this, this, this beard, it stops here. For the audio listeners, I'm sorry, and it, 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 and that's uh, on purpose, thanks to a Harry's razor. I got to keep that in check. You also get a rich lathering shave gel and a travel bag cover, so you can take it with you. So go redeem that trial set over at harrys.com slash TAC. Again, harrys.com slash TAC to redeem that offer and let them know that we sent you to help support the show. We really appreciate it when folks visit that website because Harry's is like, oh, hey, Angry Chicken actually has people listening to it and goes and checks out our razors that all three of the hosts use. <laughs> so we thank them for their support. We thank you for going to harrys.com slash TAC. Now let's, uh, let's move into this week's news and dig a little bit deeper into what Ixar had to say yesterday. Good news, everyone. <laughs> oh, no. So uh, it appears balance changes will be coming, but after HCT, uh, Ixar was uh, quite chatty. Uh, in the Hearthstone subreddit yesterday, um, we talked a lot about this. Uh, kind of hinted at it with uh, with Peter. But in case you missed it, the specific cards that sound like they're up on the chopping block, as per Ixar's mention, are Sunkeeper Tarim, Call to Arms, Spiteful Summoner, Possessed Lackey, Blood Reaver Gul'dan, Dark Pact, Doom Guard, The Caverns Below, once again, and mm -hmm. Cobalt Librarian. That last one, probably the biggest head scratcher for me. Yeah, that's weird. But I, I mean, I guess I kind of get it. It's a real. It is a really good card. They probably yes. have. Yeah. They probably have some stats on it being, you know, one of the top cards when you actually play it or something like that in Warlock. It feels um, nasty if you have the Spellstone and Cobalt Librarian at the very beginning because then you, you just have yeah. primo removal uh, mm -hmm. in a deck it's that an, always. It's an enabler, it enables. Right? Yeah, it enables <laughs> Defile as well, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's. Uh, I can see how it probably has a really high win rate that they're probably worried about, but I think that like. If you were to make changes, because Warlock is the most heavily targeted of all of these, right? They've got five Warlock cards that they're potentially talking about, and they're not even looking at Void Lords. So I think, um, you know, if you were to go about changing Possessed Lackey and Dark Pact, even just those two, the Librarian win rate might go down. So, And he sure. did say that they weren't going to change all these cards. These are just the ones that they are looking at for balance changes at the end of the month. So... We may see some changes, not others. Like, this isn't a guarantee that all nine of these are going to be changed. But, uh, yeah, I think a few changes to Warlock could kind of nerf some of the other cards by extension. I think you just need to change Gul'dan and Lackey. And then mm. the rest is, like, kind of okay, right? Yeah. Um, it, is, it is also weird. Someone in the chat just brought this up. That the Librarian upgrades the Spellstone it draws. Whereas yeah. if you uh, if you draw, like, this is a weird one. But in Wild, if you draw with... I can't remember what the name is. It's Ancestral Knowledge or something like that. If you draw the Shaman Spellstone, uh, that card overloads you, but it doesn't actually apply that overload to that Spellstone. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like a weird interaction that this one upgrades the Spellstone and that one doesn't. You know, so it's like, yeah, it is one of those <clears throat> one of those interesting interactions that just kind of makes the card even that much better, right? So, yeah. 
even though it is a, it's a small chance for that to happen. But still, yeah, yeah you're right. It happens fairly often. Just the fact that, that it happens yeah. is enough that, to be looked at. For but sure. yeah, I think Blood Reaver Gul'dan maybe should have a cap on how many demons it brings back. Or maybe it can only bring back demons that cost six or less or something like that. So you could bring back Despicable Dreadlords and Doom Guards, but you couldn't bring back... Uh, you know, Void, Lord. Void Lords and stuff like that. There, there's like so many ways you can do this where it just brings the, the, the cards just into line a little bit. It's just there's like that card to me. Blood Reaver Gul'dan is one of those cards where I'm like, if they have it, I cannot win. And yes, yeah. And other, the other cards I just concede. Like when Blood Reaver Gul'dan gets played, I just concede. Like, that's just it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there are yeah. definitely decks that can handle it, but there are a lot of decks where it's just like there's no... There's no answer to this. If this yeah. happens, I just lose the game. Again, I think it's you know back. It, it's it's worth coming back to Lackey though, because if Lackey gets adjusted and and Doom Guards and Void Lords are not dying early, Gul'dan isn't as powerful. Sure, sure. Uh, someone in the chat room just said only demons played. That could yeah. be like not all the demons the summoned, recruited. so you actually have yeah. to play them out of your hand. You couldn't just use like the weapon to bring them out and then bring them all back. That would be interesting as well. That'd actually be a buff. If you started playing Void Lord, technically, because then you don't get the Void Lords, or no, the, the well, you basically you wouldn't, wouldn't get the get... one threes. Yeah, but yeah. you have to pay nine mana. For right, the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. I'm, 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 my brain is just firing in real time. Um, sure. Yes. And yeah. you have to play the Doom Guards, which means yeah. you have to actually discard two cards. And yeah, I, I mean, I, there's there's many ways you could do it that would make sense. It's similar to Plus things like called Doom... arms. Doom guards you, coming out of the cubes wouldn't count either, which would also be yeah great. exactly like yeah, su- yeah anything that summoned wouldn't count that would be interesting yeah. it'd be one way to do it but mm-hmm. like call to arms is also one of those things where it's like yeah I could see making it five mana I could see you know uh, recruiting minions that only cost one or less and what things like you know you could do all sorts of different weird things to it um, it's just it's like which is the most elegant which is the one that actually makes the card maybe not completely obsolete but you know, in line with the rest of it. Because if you think about what Call to Arms does, it's just nuts, man. You draw three cards and you instantly play them. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Four mana draw three cards would actually be a busted card, right? <laughs> but it's like, no, yeah, draw three cards, play those three cards. And you're like, wow, just, okay. Just put them on the board. Here yeah. they go. Also, and it's, it's even really draw good. specific cards, right? It's not just draw any three sure. cards. It's like specifically minions that yeah. are also of this cost. Like it's very targeted. Yeah. But like has Nourish ever not been in Druid? You know, it's yeah. five mana draw three cards. You know, it's like this is four mana draw three play them. It's That's nuts. That's yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah. So, I mean, of these, he also mentioned uh, Baku Paladin Hero Power. S- oh, yeah, that yeah, that's right. He mentioned making it maybe a 2-2, two, two, a single 2-2 two, two, instead of two one ones because... Of the board buffing aspect of it. Yeah. He, he feels yeah, that the more, value there. Is, more value is, is laden in multiple bodies versus the stats, which I don't yeah. think he's wrong. Um, but he also kind of walks back his own comments about, about the, the Paladin Hero Power like it sounds like it's pretty far down the totem pole of concern, mm-hmm. uh, and I would. Well, yeah, and I think he also mentioned making them not silver hand recruits. Yeah, like yeah. if you have Baku, make those two one ones something else spawn of Baku or something like that. Like things that aren't uh, buffable by so like the level, level up. up. And, yeah. yeah, which is also interesting. I mean, I, I would think maybe you want to do that. Like I don't know. Even Paladin, I guess, is mostly fine. This, but, this uh, is... Yeah, with Odd Paladin, it's crazy. When you get to level up, it's like, okay, game's over. Yeah. But also in Wild, it's nuts because you can also do Quartermaster. It's just like there's yes, so yeah. many freaking ways. Yeah, and, th- and this gets into the, the overall chain or the overall challenge of, of balance changes is you got to think about, well, what, what rises out of this? You know, if we knock X, Y, and Z down, what's coming up? Because if, if even Paladin and Murloc Paladin get dinged by a Call to Arms adjustment... Is Baku Paladin now o- oppressive? Maybe. No, yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah, it, especially if you make changes to to Warlock and Paladin, uh, and then also Quest Rogue. It's like, okay, well, now who's the king of the hill? Because someone's gonna be, and we're all gonna complain about that too. I just, I just think really the the key here is the cards that came out before Witchwood that are preventing Witchwood cards from seeing play is more important to me than anything because I do think the meta. I know people are like pissing and moaning about it as if it's the most ridiculous meta we've ever had. And it's just people have such short memories. It's like you guys don't remember the Undertaker meta. You don't remember yeah, like original Rogue meta. You don't remember, you know, it's like there's always been a king of the hill. <laughs> this is so, something that 
uh, Kyle always talks about how he, he imagines anything he reads on the internet is the same person. So if one day someone is like, oh my God, it's the worst thing ever. And the next day reads a comment like, oh, this is great. I'm so happy. He gets, he gets frustrated. He's like, but yeah, just yesterday you were complaining. And I would like to remind everyone <laughs> that it's not all necessarily the same person. And sure. also uh, some people may have started playing after Undertaker and they don't have any yeah. concept of just how busted it was. But I, I do I do seem to see this sentiment a lot that like somehow this is the worst meta we've ever had. And it's like, man, there is so many decks right now. You can play basically any class and there is something that will work. And that's kind of the idea, right? Like, yes, it's annoying that there are a few cards out there that their power levels are pushing out other things. I think that's I think that's really the issue. And if we could just fix that, then like really you just want diversity. Like mm -hmm. I, I always know that there's going to be a class that's the best. Um, as long as it has a way to beat it and there's a way to play kind of any class that you really like. And there, there is, I think, you know, what's the worst class right now? Is it maybe shaman? They have even shaman. That's pretty good. You know, is it warrior? They have dead man's warrior rush warrior. Those are pretty good. You know, it's like, I can kind of think of a deck for every class that actually right. works yeah and that's and that's where I'm, I'm i'm with you i can't say i've been seeing the sentiment that it's the worst meta ever um i've certainly i've just seen a lot of complaining and, and, and I, I i'm not going to push back on that at all because there has been no. um i even myself i mean like i'm part of it i'm just really bored with void lords i just don't want to play against sure. them anymore and to a certain degree paladin i i'm biased in that regard because that's what i was playing before the swap i have a fondness for the for what they're trying to do because that's what i was playing for a while uh but even then i'm just like yeah i don't need to see call to arms uh, play three things again and get lucky with knife juggler and or not getting lucky with knife juggler might yeah be the I, that's episode. something that's really annoying is the, the juggler placement things like that it's yeah. uh yeah it's weird yeah and I, I think that's that's fairer and to me it's and more honest maybe that's just because i'm feeling it's just like it just feels bad like I'm, i don't think it necessarily is bad i think the balance is actually pretty solid um and as you mentioned like there's actual deck diversity we've had way worse uh long stints in this game with with uh you know maybe three playable classes if you wanted to climb mm -hmm. and that's definitely not the case right now but whatever the case so is we, have we talked very much about sunkeeper tarum because i feel like that inclusion on this list is a little bit or probably the most unexpected out of all of them but maybe possibly librarian being the other exception but like yeah is it just because on an even paladin with their um, kind of upgraded, discounted, whatever hero powers are so prevalent right now? Is that why Tarim, you guys think Tarim's on the list? Or is this always something that they should have been looking at to nerf since it came it's, out on Goro? It's a super good card, but I don't think that it should be changed because it's, yeah, it's that's an answer to a too. lot of things, too. Yeah, you know? like yeah. it's good, but I've never been like, oh, man, Tarim, game's over. Like I feel with Gul'dan a lot of the time. <laughs> I, sometimes yeah. I sometimes that does happen. I mean, it, it, Paladins can build up a pretty big board and then get the Tarim going. It is It can be GG, but mm -hmm. I mean, maybe like one thing you could do is remove the taunt from it. And then it's like, because I think one of the problems is that you you throw yeah, down the 3-7 taunt and you protect all these 3-3s three and you oh, can't yeah. get to them anymore, you know? Yeah, um, it is very. Because that's the discussion that I've seen is that because you can get it off of Stonehill, you can put it into an odd yeah. paladin when you wouldn't normally have access to that. So well, also paladins can play like three of them potentially. Yes, yeah, and, yeah. So yeah, that's that's where my head is. I mean, it is a supremely powerful card, but as as far as all all of these, I would put Terran pretty low on my list of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, I think if you change like things like call to arms, Tarim inherently becomes weaker too because it's harder to spam the board. Yeah. yeah, and before before even took off, you know, before you're the Raven, um, we weren't. We I say we as paladins weren't really running things like equality and consecrate, and Tarim was one of our main ways to get through. Uh, now that he's being included in even, and since they have fewer cards to choose from, they are starting. They are now including consecrate and equality. Now this relatively aggressive deck has even more ways uh, to get through larger taunts. So that's that's another thing I would consider because mm -hmm. uh, man, I I remember being in so many games before the la before the launch of Witchwood where I was just like, I need Terum. It's my only way to get through what they have. And now it's like, nope, I got a quality. We're good. It's fine, and I still have Terum. So. 
Uh, Dills, I know you're on a hard out, but uh, Nagasi. I am. I actually was just going to bring that up that I have to leave, but I do want to bring something up before I go. I know it's not in the show notes, but um, something that I just kind of found out about, I think, yes, two days ago. Um, And it's a downer. Uh, I don't want to make a huge deal about it, but uh, there's a community member, Toast the Badger, who recently passed away. And uh, I just kind of want to bring it up because she has been around forever uh, in the Hearthstone scene. I remember the, <clears throat> the tournament that I got second place to Chalky. She Man was grind, the one yeah. who contacted me afterwards to ask for the desk, deck list and uh, did like a short interview. So I didn't know her super well, but uh, she, it's worth like giving her a mention here on the show because I know she was important to a lot of people. And if you're interested, she, there are some people who she kind of started this hashtag badass women of Hearthstone thing. They had a whole Hearthstone league for just women, and I think some of those people are going to be like trying to put a put together like a tournament in her honor. So if you are interested, if people are interested in that, check out hashtag Badass Women of Hearthstone on Twitter. And uh, I think yeah, there's like a tweet four hours ago. So they're trying to find people to help organize and put it on. So that's worth worth checking out. Yeah, I I, I just found out about it as well, and uh, it really bums me out. We I I. I didn't know toast toast the badger like per- personally. Uh, I'd only had a few kind of uh, discussions with her over, over Twitter, but she first hit my radar after dream hack, uh, the first dream hack in Austin uh, where Terrence may had that incredible run. And unfortunately afterwards, we also had to have this big discussion uh, yeah. ab- about yeah. just straight up racism Moderation. in Twitch yeah. chat. And uh, I think the article is still up over on ghost gamers.net. Like she hit my radar cause she had an article up over there talking about, I believe it was called the, actually I found it. Yeah. Enough is enough. You know, confessions of a, of a Twitch chat moderator, a brilliantly written piece that said, I think everything that needed to be said about what happened over that weekend. Uh, and ever since then, I just, she was a brilliant follow, like just so many great insights into the scene. Uh, I was just so freaking bummed when I heard about it. Yeah, it's it's really a shame. But you know, if you if people want to find out more about it, I, obviously, like we're not the people to like tell all the information. But there's a post on Reddit from I think it's an ex husband with yeah. a lot of details about what was going on with her and everything like that. So um, yeah, I recommend I think it anybody. Was actually, it was pinned on Reddit, so oh okay, shouldn't, cool. Shouldn't yeah. be hard to find. Yeah, uh, everyone should go check it out. She she definitely left a legacy, and that's that's cool. So I just want to bring that up before I leave because uh, it is, uh, you know, it's it's important. I think that we recognize the people who are really important in this scene, and she definitely was one of them. Yeah. And with that, I'm out. I gotta go. <laughs> All right, dude. I gotta go to work. Well, uh, sorry we'll... to bring everything down, but uh, there's more stuff to talk about, right? So you guys, uh, you guys have a fun rest of the show. Dude, it had to be mentioned. Have a good one. All right. See All you right. next week. Yeah, Dills had a Dills had a hard out. So, um. Let me just uh, adjust the overlay here. Hey, something works smoothly. <laughs> yes. Overlay number three. <laughs> uh, the only last thing we were going to talk about was was Naga Sea Witch. Naga, Naga right. Sea Witch was also brought up um, by XR yesterday. It actually, I believe, kind of started the whole conversation. Uh, but I wanted to lead with the standard stuff because we've been talking about, we've basically been complaining about Void Lord for like four weeks straight on this show. So I, I want yeah, to Yeah, and I think the reason why Ixar actually like went on to Reddit and started talking about all these different things is because he had actually responded to somebody's tweet talking about Naga Sea Witch and, and because of the way the tweets were split up, it made it kind of look like if you only saw one of his tweets that he was talking about Naga sea Witch being like a flavor of the week thing and people are like, oh my God, it's been months and months and months. What do you mean flavor of the week? That's a ridiculous comment. So he went into much more detail over on Reddit and um, basically like... They are acknowledging Naga Sea Witch is a problem. It's also going to be like looked at for I believe from the way he was talking about it, it looks like they're looking to solve it with the with the end of the month patch as well. Um, which is kinda interesting because Naga Sea Witch is not tied to HCT at all, so just fix it. <laughs> right, but but we also know that it's a challenge to push updates to this game. Uh, True. because True. of the its mobile presence. Uh, yeah. And the way things like specifically the iTunes or the Apple yeah, App Store, Apple Store. is uh, problematic to run quick light updates too. So I, I get that. That doesn't bother me as much. Also, we waited long enough for Naga Sea Witch, which I guess I can wait a little bit longer. Personally, it has just, I've just haven't, it's not affecting me personally. I'm not playing wild. New meta is enough for me. Uh, but 
Yeah. But by the way, we didn't really talk about like how this even came up. A user on Reddit paid to run an ad titled Nagasi, which is not fun. I will pay for this ad until it is nerfed. <laughs> and I, to just remove like whether that's appropriate or not. I think this is hilarious. <laughs> Definitely a way to get your point across being like, hey, guess what, Hearthstone? I have money. I would rather pay to run an ad than give you my money because Nagasi, which is so unfun. There was actually um, a post as well. We've had Dane on the show before, and he's a super chill, super fun, awesome guy who basically never loses his cool. And there's a video of him a couple weeks ago losing to Nagasi, which and just kind of like going off. From, for, from like Dane's perspective, right? It still wasn't nearly like the rant that we've seen from other streamers and stuff, but just like seeing Dane even moderately lose his cool because of Nagasi, which because Dane is a specifically a wild only player. Mm -hmm. So to see him actually kind of lose it over this was like, wow, I hope someone's paying attention because <laughs> if this is the way Dane is feeling, it's gone way too far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I uh, I agree, but I, I just thought, I just thought the ad thing was, man, it just it just oh, it, it it hit me right in the funny. Bone. I thought it was the funniest damn thing I'd seen in a while because of all the of all the things we're talking about. Like I th I think there was a debate to be had about call to arms about warlock not really losing much. Like there's a, a conversation to be had there. I don't think Nagasi, which is up for debate, and I don't think it's been up to up for debate for a while now. And uh, God, that was just that was hilarious. So um, glad to hear it'll be getting fixed. I'm sure we will be talking about specific changes very soon once they get announced. Yeah, I'm sure because they did say like end of the month once H HCT is passed. So I mean, we're got to be a week or maybe less away from actual changes being announced. Um, I I hope they don't wait until after HCT to announce the changes, but I would kind of understand that from a marketing perspective as well, because like you don't ever want people to have the conversation. They're going to have the conversation anyways, when people lose to like a Q block in HCT, like, Oh, doesn't that feel bad? Because you know, Gul'dan's on the chopping block or dark packs on the chopping block or whatever. But once you actually know specifically what cards are going to be changed and by how much, then, you know, that conversation gets that much more ammo. So I can kind of understand if they hold off until after HCT in order to tell us what the changes are going to be. But I kind of hope they don't because I just I want to know. I want to I want to feel like something's being done, even if the actual patch is going to be after HCT. So I'm glad XR posted all this stuff, though, because it's, it's good to know kind of what's what's up and coming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, personally, I think I'm fine in either way. Like I'm in the camp of I would just like the changes before. Like if if you've come to it sounds like they haven't come to a decision, but if they have like just go pull the trigger but i'm i would so much rather watch a tournament that where changes had just been made than watch a tournament where i know exactly what is coming and what's going to be played yeah but i think this is more fair to the players than it is fair to um like the observers you know like hct eu um playoffs have now happened that feeds four players into what's going to be the summer championship which is then going to lead into blizzcon so i think like everybody qualifying on the same playing field there's already been talk about how it's not necessarily a level playing field because to get in in eu you had to get like over 40 points but or sorry over 30 points but then to get in in na you only had to have like 20 points like it just the standards for the regions weren't the same and that can can be quite frustrating so i think like if then you had the eu um qualifying playoffs and then you made a bunch of changes and then you had the other regions playoffs like it just it's w another thing that makes the playing field not necessarily level so i think waiting until each of these regional playoffs are done and then looking at making changes is just it's it's more fair i think to the players there's a whole debate here but I and i know and i know there is I, I definitely know that there is and we've been on um, both sides of it in the past before but i just think like the more stability you can provide your players the better because yes all of the players are going to get the changes all at the exact same time. So everyone's at the same either advantage or disadvantage, depending on how you want to phrase it. Um, but still, their tournament is going to be different than the EU tournament. And that's where I think 
it gets a little sketchy for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think it, I think it's it's very fair to say just like keeping it the same is the most fair because yeah. the, the the debate is like well maybe deck building or understanding a shifting meta should be part of uh, a pro Hearthstone player's uh, skill set. Uh, that being said, yeah, it's it's not going to be true for every single player. So in the like, I think if we're trying to like be cold and calculated about it, yeah, I think it's just it is definitely more fair to just leave things alone until after the playoffs wrap up. Yeah, because I mean, especially the way that Hearthstone works, it also kind of penalizes those players that don't have a network, that don't have a team, that have been you know practicing on their own really, really hard, and then if you all of a sudden say, okay here's a whole bunch of changes and you have a day to submit your deck list and blah, 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 blah. Like it just, especially with changes like the ones we're talking about with some of the strongest decks with spiteful with warlock, you know, Mm -hmm. with call to arms, we see really, really high amounts of these, of warlocks, priests, mages, paladins, all of these things are very prevalent in HCT. So it would just like, it's not just going to change warlock. It's going to potentially take Q block totally out of the tournament meta. And then that shakes up the whole entire tournament meta. So it's not even just that they're like, because Q block has been basically what people have built the tournament meta around. So if you're talking about taking that one deck out, it's like everything else collapses. And then if you don't have a huge network behind you in terms of a team, then you're going to be in trouble. And I just, I really think that that punishes some of the smaller up and coming players and that's definitely what Hearthstone doesn't want to do. Yeah. No, I think that's all uh, all very fair, even though I'm a selfish, selfish uh, viewer who just wants to be entertained. Well, but the thing is, like, so we wait until the end of the HCT playoffs. We get our changes. All that's fine and dandy. And then, you know, we have a new tournament meta that's kind of coming halfway through an expansion cycle. So we're getting more shakeups than we would kind of otherwise. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, we've got I, like, like I said, our I think it's... early Witchwood tournament meta that is actually quite close to our year of the Mammoth tournament meta, but we've got our early Witchwood tournament meta, and then we're going to go into something like a late Witchwood tournament meta for the rest of HCT, and I think that's fine. There's uh, there's a bunch of Dream Hacks coming up. There's a bunch of uh, yeah, there's lots of tour stops, lots of stuff happening. So once the changes actually go through, uh, it's going to be uh, going to be really interesting. Cool. Yeah. So. I'm fine. I, I can wait to hear what the changes are going to be till whenever at this point. Because <laughs> if the changes aren't coming before, then I, I'm, I can wait. Uh, t- I don't know. Talk to me in two weeks when maybe there's nothing to talk about on the show at all. And I'm just like, why haven't they announced the changes? But but I think I'll be okay. There's always HCT to talk about, though. We could talk esports all uh, day. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the same decks we've seen for <laughs> almost half a year. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess that brings us to the end of the show. I uh, want to thank our patrons again over at patreon.com slash TAC. If you like uh, the Angry Chicken, if you like what we're doing here and you want to support the three of us, uh, patreon.com slash TAC is the best way to do so. Uh, everything helps, whether it's a dollar, two, five, whatever works for you. We really do appreciate it. On this episode, we want to thank some of our newer patrons. Thank you to Cal L. Uh, didn't actually that there is a last name there. The initial is L. This is not a Superman reference. Uh, <laughs> James D and Tony C. Thank you very much for your support of the show. And you, again, go to patreon.com slash TAC if you want to support us. Uh, also thanks to our producers, Declan H, Michael N, Sean C, Johnny S and L V E. We have swag available. If you're unaware, we have Angry Chicken t-shirts. Those can be found at shirts.amove.tv. We also have custom etched glassware, coffee mugs, pint glasses, stuff like that. Go to etched.amove.tv. Yeah, other than that, um, just in case there's any issues with downloads, I've been just letting everybody know uh, the hosting service that I use for amove.tv went down in flames last week, so I'm having to literally hand move seven years worth of MP3s and relink all of them. No big deal. Yeah, I've gotten, I think, the 50 most recent episodes of Angry Chicken relinked. If you're going back more than 50 episodes, it's probably busted. Uh, but that should be fixed in the relative future. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Uh, amove.tv slash TAC for the back catalog once that is fixed. Other than that, the YouTube is fine. That's obviously on YouTube and unaffected. You can catch up there if you want to see really old episodes. Uh, Dills is gone. He can't uh, promote his own stuff, so we'll promote it for him. Check him out on Twitter at Willie Dills or twitch.tv slash Willie Dills. You can see him over there streaming uh, usually Hearthstone. Joss, how about you? 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch. I'm at Joss Plays. That's J O C E Plays. Uh, obviously, we talked a little bit about Toast the Badger earlier, so I'm going to plug my show, Slaying Demons, tonight. Spurred by what happened with Toast, we're actually doing an episode about, um, well, just suicide, dealing with friends with oppression, and we're having uh, two psychologists coming to join us tonight to talk about um, kind of like how to just deal with all of this. So if you guys have any interest in that, uh, that's going to be tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. You can check that out. We stream it live on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash JossPlays. Definitely check that out. I'm still just completely bummed about that. And obviously, if you're struggling with that, I mean, there are so many uh, support outlets out there. I'm like, if you need help, seek it. And there's no way to segue into the fact that I'm Gary no. on Twitter and all these seemingly very unimportant things uh, in the wake of tragedy like this. So um, follow me there so you can be reminded how uh, shallow and fleeting idiot people like me can be. <laughs> so uh, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Huge thanks, by the way, to the community team over at Team 5 for putting together this Peter Whalen interview. Uh Clearly, it's been a little crazy over there because, I don't know, Ben Brode left, Hamilton Chu is out. <laughs> They've got some things going on, and they still managed to schedule an interview uh, for this show, and we really appreciate that. So big uh, hats off to Team 5, and our thanks again. Thank you for listening. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. Until next time, job's done. Job's done. Should we 3, 2, 1, yell yes in unison? Well, you kind of killed it now. No, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you hit the brakes even harder. Thank you. <laughs> well, now that, now that we're here, three, two, one, yes! Yes! Skype lag! <laughs> <laughs> I'll let it together and post at least for the audio version to make us sound cool. Or I'll just leave this because I personally find us screwing up more entertaining than fixing it in post. But anyways. <sighs> Peter was fun. Yeah, Peter's always fun. He's such a good guy. It's been a while since we... I didn't realize it was that long ago that um, <laughs> that he, that we interviewed him for Gadget Zan. My lord. Mm -hmm. That was nuts. That was that would have been the Broadless BlizzCon. That was the Broadless BlizzCon, yeah. The Broadless BlizzCon. That would have been a good uh, episode title to use back then. Um, yeah, wow. That was forever ago. For some reason, I thought it was this year. Do we, do we do a Hearthstone interview this year? No. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That would explain it. That would explain why I was like, yeah, Peter. Uh, we were going to, and then we ended up having Broad and Yongwoo on the live Angry Chicken and getting all of our questions out of the way That's there. So then we didn't really have anything left. Um for our actual scheduled interview the next day. You are correct. That is exactly how it went down. And scheduling was crazy anyway. Yes, yeah. Because um, it was a, our scheduled interview time was the same time as the Heroes finals, I think, that you had mm -hmm. to cover for ITN. So, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. But, yeah. All right. Well, that's the show. Chat room, you've been awesome. Uh, I don't know why I would assume you would be up, uh, anything other than awesome. <laughs> but you were very kind. Thank you for being nice to Peter and not being like, Robble, 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 we didn't like this answer. Yeah, I didn't have to get mad at anybody. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Does that, has that been happening recently? <laughs> well, anytime we do Team 5 interviews, I always have to swing the ban hammer at least once. Mm. It's uh, It seems to go with the territory. Yeah. It's 262, not 626. It's fat fingering the damn numbers. <laughs> my god 626 how many more years would that be Ugh. live I from mean, the retirement yay! home <laughs> that would be so many <laughs> welcome back to the angry chicken today we're talking about how the hell is Tyrion Fordring still in this game so yeah if we do like 50 episodes a year that would be another like 5 to 10 yeah like so like eight-ish years. <laughs> no, it's not that far. <laughs> oh, God. 
I was still, I technically still would not yet be in my 40s. Both Dills and I would be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but none Which of us would be. It's kind of weird to think about. Ugh. I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the realization that I'm almost 10 years out of college and it doesn't feel like it's been that long. So <laughs> decades go by fast, y'all. <laughs> it seems to go by faster and faster yeah. as you get older. Yeah, it's, uh, it's creepy. But I'm going to kill the stream. Thank you, everybody. Bye, stream. Talk to you later.